I'm not going to necessarily preach on this. I'll refer to it a little bit uh, as we go, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to try to uh, unpack everything that's here, but we'll, we'll refer to it. Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, I'll start in verse 16 and uh, go to chapter five, verse five. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look, not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we're still naked in this tent we groan, being burdened not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who's given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight with a lot before us. The thing I pray for most is that we would, if we don't know Jesus, come to know him. Uh, If we do know him, that we'd come to know him better, that we'd come to have more confidence in your spirit and your word. And Father, I pray that as we talk about a big, complicated topic of mental illness and what your son has to do with that, I pray you'd give us wisdom. I pray you'd give us grace. I pray you'd give us your help in every way. And Father, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. My uh, introduction <clears throat> to mental illness came from my mother. So uh, my mom uh, got diagnosed while I was growing up and up through high school. She got diagnosed with a lot of different mental illnesses. So she, was, uh, she got diagnosed with depression. She got diagnosed as a manic depressive. Uh, now we call that bipolar, but back when, when she was coming up, she got diagnosed manic depressive. Uh, she uh, got diagnosed with uh, alcohol use disorder. The street term for that's alcoholism or uh, drunkenness, uh, but, uh, but the official term for it is uh, alcohol use disorder. She got diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. So she, she had uh, a catalog of mental illness diagnoses that she, uh, uh, that she struggled with, uh, that she dealt with, and that she was treated for for decades. And so I got to my, my introduction. I knew mental illness. I knew about it because I was seeing it in my living room. I was seeing it with my mom. I would see these crazy behaviors. Um, and I don't know when I figured out uh, that what, uh, what she's dealing with is something that our culture calls mental illness. But, uh, but I had a very firsthand and personal experience with it. You know what, how far can I walk out before they can't see me on that camera? Does anybody in here know? Can I go over to that whiteboard over there? I can try. Maybe I, I'm coming to the camera, I'm coming back. I'm gonna move this over here. Um, so uh, it might be helpful to uh, write a few things down. Um, they tried to get me to uh, come up with a PowerPoint presentation, but I tried PowerPoint about 10 years ago and it was a disaster. Uh, it's just better if I do it on my own. Um, but um, but I, my, my first experience with mental illness was very personal in that way. What we call mental illness, there's, there's actually a whole big thing underneath it. And it's based on uh, this really technical sounding thing called the biogenic theory of mental disorder. Okay, the biogenic theory of mental disorder. Now, two buzzwords here. First of all, biogenic. What that means is the things that we understand and call mental illness or mental disorders, they are based in our biology. Okay? Um, it's, it's something different than a behavior problem. Uh, it, it's something different than an environmental factor. Uh, it is based in our biology. That's the bi- biogenic part. But then there's this very crucial word here called theory. 
There is the, it's the biogenic theory. When something is a theory, it's not a what? Fact. And if it is a fact, we don't know it yet. There, there are all, many facts started out as a theory, but as long as it's got that theory attached to it, we don't know it yet. Uh, this is the first thing we're going to say tonight that might be uh, a whack in the forehead here, is um, this, uh, this biogenic uh, idea is a theory, and it is highly debated with people a lot smarter and a lot more educated and a lot more experienced uh, in, in the field. We'll talk about that as we go. Um, when you think about the term mental illness, when you use it, and when I use it, and when you read about it on a blog or on social media or something like that, most of the time, uh, we just mean, we, we might even say it a little bit crassly, crassly, we might say, well, that's somebody that's just messed up. That's somebody that has a very significant problem. Uh, the really crass way to say it is that's crazy. That, that, that person's crazy. They, they, there's something is wrong with them. They're, they're not just uh, a little bit off. Uh, they're not just having a problem. They are mentally ill. Isn't that the way you hear it? This, this is something serious that's a deviation from normal. That's, that's the way they kind of talk about it on the street. There is a more technical way to talk about it. And the more technical way to talk about it starts with this great big book right here. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual number four text revision. This is not the current Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, it, this was the last one that I was willing to pay for. Um, uh, so th the, the latest one is DSM-5. That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, and this is the repository for mental illness. If you want to know technically what a mental illness is, you need, this, you need the latest edition of this book. And the definition of mental illness that is in DSM-5, so this is the most recent one, uh, I put it in your notes, I'm going to read it uh, for us. A mental disorder is a syndrome characterized by clinically significant disturbance in an individual's cognition, emotion, regulation, or behavior that reflects a dysfunction in the psychological, biological, or developmental processes underlying mental functioning. Mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress in social, occupational, or other important activities, an acceptable or culturally approved response to a common stressor or loss, such as the death of a loved one, is not a mental disorder. Socially deviant behavior, e.g. political, religious, or sexual, and conflicts that are primarily between the individual and society are not mental disorders, unless the deviance or conflict results from a dysfunction in the individual as described above. I know. Yeah. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of words, uh, and, and I'm not going to sit here and try to exposit everything that it says, but here's the point. This is them telling us what a mental illness is. Um, let, me, let me put it in a little bit more street language. A mental disorder, I'm, I'm just basing it off this language here, this is, uh, I, haven't, I haven't gotten to any evaluation yet. Um, a mental illness or a mental disorder is uh, something that traces back to behavior that is outside the range of normal. That's what it is. If you have a behavior that is outside the range of normal, you've got a mental illness. Do you, do you hear all those qualifiers? If you do this, if, you know, if, if something after your spouse dies, that's not a mental illness. Uh, if there's normal environmental factors, that's not a mental illness. We're talking about something the language is clinically significant. Clinically significant. Um, so here is, um, um, here's the issue. 
Everybody realizes that there are extreme behaviors and there are extreme problems. Everybody realizes we're living in a broken world where everybody is not okay. The question is, how do we define who's okay and who's not? Do you see? How do we do that? Uh, You have to be very careful. What is normal? That's the the million-dollar question. What is normal? And think about how tricky this is. If we have a definition of mental illness that is too broad, then we've all got them, right? Uh, and, And if everybody's mentally ill, if everybody's crazy, if everybody is diagnosable, then nobody is, right? Then every, crazy's normal. Mentally ill's normal. So, so we can't have a definition that's too broad and have everybody have it. But then what happens is if it's too narrow and nobody has it, then now it's, it's worthless in the other direction. Now we, now we have categories that don't mean anything to anybody because we've defined it too narrowly, so nobody, nobody has it. So what is the solution? The solution of, so far, of the editors and contributors to the DSM is to uh, do a couple of things. They pick, they pick a, a disorder. They pick a mental illness. And, and let's, let's take, let's take an, uh, a, a one that makes a lot of sense to a lot of people, um, depression. So that's a, that's a diagnosable mental illness, technically speaking, because it's in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. But um, what's the difference between clinical depression, as it's called, we're talking about somebody who's got the mental illness, and somebody who is sad because their spouse died? What's the difference? Um, what's the difference between somebody who is, um, has clinical depression and somebody who has uh, what they call seasonal affective disorder, the acronym SAD, seasonal affective disorder? What's, what's the difference? Some, some, people are, some people get sad when it is cold out and the sky is gray and there's not a lot of daylight. That's seasonal affective disorder. That's not depression. They're both mental illnesses, but what's the difference? What's the difference? Well, the way they make the distinction is they do two things. They come up first with a list of symptoms. Now, there's no, this is very important. I'm going to talk about this as we go. There's no blood test. There's no medical workup. There's, you don't have, um, you don't have midichlorians in your bloodstream and when we draw out your blood, you have 100 midichlorians, and that means you have depression versus the person who has 200 midichlorians who's totally not depressed. That's, that's not the way this works. It's a list of behaviors. And so there might, be, there might be a list of 12 behaviors under depression. I think there's 15 or something. I get them confused. But, but let's say there's a list of 15 behaviors under depression, and you know if you have depression if you have at least seven the numbers change. If you have at least four of 12, if you have at least seven of 15, then you have depression, but there's still one more factor too. You have to have that for uh, an extended period of time, and that changes as well. So how do we come up with a problem that not everybody has, but also nobody has? Well, we come up with a problem, we give a list of behaviors, and if you have X number of behaviors for a certain amount of time, then you've crossed the line into mental illness or a diagnosable disorder. That's the way they try to thread the needle. And and if you just even pick this up and flip through it, you're going to see diagnosis after diagnosis, and some of them will have 12 behaviors, some of them will have 15 behaviors, and if you have seven of those 15, then you've got it, unless you have number two and number eight, and then you need six. Like, there's all these combinations that go together, and, and somebody who's reading this can diagnose you with it when you meet those behaviors. Now, why do this? Who is helped by having this? The the reason for this book and others like it is because of insurance. So uh, it's the truth. It's, It's for insurance. So if you are a therapist, 
um, let, let's say, let's say that you, um, let's say you are, you've been feeling sad for the last several months and you come to first counseling to talk with one of our pastors or one of our counselors about the, the sorrow that you've been experiencing for the last few months. Um, we'll have a conversation with you. We'll talk with you about your problem. We're going to try to understand where that problem came from. We're going to try to understand how to move towards help and hope and, and, uh, and all the rest. Um, but nobody is going to pay us for that conversation. Uh, in order uh, to make money having those kinds of conversations, you have to be licensed by the state. You have to be a licensed therapist who has the authority to use this book and when you use this book, and I don't say you're sad, but I say you have depression, that makes it a conversation that's reimbursable by insurance. So that's, that's the reason. And listen, you can like that or hate it. it. It's life. I mean, that's just, that's the way it is. There, there has to be some kind of mechanism so that it's not an all-you-can-eat buffet at the insurance company, and this is the way. This is the way uh, licensed uh, secular therapists get paid uh, is with the diagnoses in this book. So it's very, it's very important. This, this book right here represents billions, billions of dollars. Um, whatever else it represents is up for debate. How do you get in there? How do you get in there? Well, this is very important. How, how you get the name of a disorder in this book is make or break. Remember the biogenic theory of mental disorder. It's, this is biologically based, but that's a theory. Uh, the biology is important because biology is more or less concrete, and we've got a physician or two in here, so I'm going to get fact-checked real quick, all right? The, the key to the practice of medicine is the problem of pathology, right? If, if I'm going to have medicine practi practiced upon me, I need to have a pathology. There has to be something physically wrong with me in order for a physician to be able to fix it, Right? Okay, so um, I had all these uh, I had all these brain surgeries, um, and the reason I had those brain surgeries is because I have this little nerve uh, in my brain somewhere up in here, and uh, there is um, uh, there used to be a little tiny blood vessel that rested right on top of that nerve, and every time my heart beat. Uh, that blood vessel got a pulse and it would bang on that nerve. And over years, it broke through the coating of that nerve called the myelin sheathing. And once it got through the sheathing, it started doing damage to the nerve. And it started twitching and moving and leaking and all this weird, gross stuff. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I went to the doctor and they put me in this big machine, and they took pictures of my brain. And I go and I met with everybody. I met with everybody. And they put this image on the screen, and they told me it was an image of my brain, and it could have been a Volkswagen Beetle parked on the surface of the moon. I don't know how y'all read these things, but they assured me that it was my brain. They assured me that this was one of my cranial nerves, and that this dark spot on it was a blood vessel that was doing active damage to the nerve and it had to come off. There was, that's the pathology. The, path, the pathology is there is a blood vessel um, where it is not supposed to be. Uh, we know it's not supposed to be there because we can compare your blood vessels and your nerves with other people's blood vessels and other people's nerves. And we know for a fact that when we move that blood vessel off, the pressure is going to be lifted and you'll quit having spasms. Um, it's pathology in the fix for for pathology. If I uh, am walking out the door here tonight and I trip and my arm bends in two places and I go up to Dr. Perserno and I say, is it broken? He needs to be able to know the answer to that. He needs to be able to say, yes, it's broken. 
or no. It's not broken. He'll know if it's broken because he looks at bones all day long and he's going to say, hey, yeah, that bone's broken. I know what a, what a whole bone looks like. Yours is broken in two and we know how to fix that. Uh, medicine, the practice of medicine is founded on the diagnosis of pathology and the science of how to fix it. That's medicine. And Insurance companies, honestly, and we love, the, the part about biology that we love is it's concrete. We can look at pictures, we can take blood tests, we know what normal is, we know when we're outside of normal, and we know how to fix it, or at least we like to uh, think we know how to fix it. Um, that is not the way these illnesses, even the word illness is a tip of the hat to the biogenic theory. We're, we're going to call this uh, we're going to call this an illness and we're going to put it in here. And you would think, if you weren't paying attention very closely, um, that a person with seasonal affective disorder uh, has the same problem uh, as somebody who has low blood, low blood sugar. It's the same thing. Um, uh, we, we've got a physical problem leading to depression. We've got a physical problem leading to, uh, to uh, diabetes. Well, it's not. Here's the way you get in this book. And here's the thing. I'm not even, I haven't, I'm not commenting yet. I'm doing no analysis yet. We'll get to that. I'm just telling you the way it is. I just, this is just me delivering the mail. All right. So here is the way you get in. There's a committee vote. So the American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association, uh, when they work on one of these, they elect a chairman of the particular uh, DSM. Again, this is DSM-4 here. The most recent is DSM-5. They elect a chairman. The chairman starts establishing these committees. There's work groups. Uh, they're subdivided. And the way you get an illness, a disorder, a mental illness in here is if you can persuade the committee to vote in favor that it's an illness, and if you can get the committee to agree on how many behaviors out of the overall options uh, that there are. Um, it's very different than finding pathology. It is instead, it's very subjective about here's where we're going to say normal is, and we don't want to go too far over there, and we don't want to go too far over there. We need to keep it just right, and we're going to vote. Now, a, a, an illustration of, way th of the way this works uh, is if you trace the problem of homosexuality through the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and the various editions. So, in DSM-1, they didn't know they were calling it DSM-1, then they just called it the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, in DSM-1, homosexuality was listed as a mental illness. Um, so the 1960s, if you went to see a therapist and you were involved in a same-sex relationship, you uh, could and uh, would be diagnosed as a mentally ill person. Now, that went over like a pregnant pole vaulter, all right? Uh, which is to say it was not received well, all right? So here's what happens in the early 1970s. In the early 1970s, the APA starts to, hey, we need another edition of this. We, we need to tweak some things. The, uh, the clinicians out there, uh, they're uh, making other clinical observations. They want to add things to the list. They want to take some things away. They want to modify some of the behaviors. So what happened is LGBTQ activists in the early 1970s began lobbying the APA to take homosexuality out of the DSM. And in 1973, the APA voted, and all of a sudden, homosexuality was not a mental illness anymore. Homosexuality was normal. It was declared to be so uh, by, by the APA. And then what they created, they created a new one. They, they replace it with a different disorder called sexual orientation disorder. And here's how you got sexual orientation disorder. Um, uh, it, was, it, it was adjusted. There was a period of revision in the 1970s and the 1980s where it changed names. First it was sexual orientation disorder, and then it was, uh, it was ego dystonic disorder, uh, which sounds really weird. But, um, but basically what it is, you, got, you were mentally ill on those editions of the DSM if uh, you were gay but didn't want to be. 
So now think about, think about how different that is. In the 1960s, if you were a homosexual, you were mentally ill. By a few votes, because of political pressure, by the 1980s, you were mentally ill if you were gay and didn't want to be. And now all those are out, and now there's um, a gender disorder otherwise specified, I believe is what it's called. And one of the, one of the symptoms of that is if you experience same-sex attraction but don't like it. Um, so, uh, so this is where we are. There is, uh, there's been a complete change. And here's the thing, nothing objectively changed except the opinions of the people who were voting on it. Think about how different this is than, than, than medicine. I trip out here, my arm's bending in two places, and uh, I say, Rick, is it broken? I'm picking on you now, I'm very sorry about that. Um, uh, I say, Rick, is it broken? What if, what if Dr. Paserno turns to you and says, guys, I don't know, let's vote. How many of you think Heath's arm is broken? Um, and if, if the majority vote no, and he sends me home with my floppy arm, was anybody helped? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's worse than it used to be. Um, and, and so I, I want you to understand that this is not... Uh, what you uh, think it is. Again, you can like that or not, but there's no use pretending that it's something other than what it is. Um, As a matter of fact, uh, what it means to have a mental illness is something dramatically uh, more complicated, uh, dramatically more controversial, uh, dramatically more political uh, than anything you would read about in Time magazine. One of the interesting things is uh, um, there, there's always a difference between what scientists and, and official people know and, uh, and, and what Time Magazine and the person on the street reports, but there's, that gap is starting to be closed here. I want, you to, um, I want you to have all of that in mind, and I want to read you some quotes from three people, none of whom are Christians, okay? Uh, the first one is uh, from... Uh, the chairman of psychiatry at Duke University, and he was the chairman of DSM-4. His name's Alan Francis. Um, he, he was the chairman of DSM-4, uh, and by the time he saw the way the sausage was made, he was so disgusted, he left. He, he refused to work on any more diagnostical and statistical manuals. He's, uh, I don't know if he's still the chairman of psychiatry at Duke University, but listen, you gotta be pretty spiffy to be the head of psychiatry at Duke University. You gotta be a top-notch guy. Of all the psychiatrists in the world to be selected to be the chairman of this thing, you gotta be a big old boy. And Alison Francis says, I'm not doing it anymore. And this is what, uh, this is what Dr. Francis said after his work on DSM-IV. I have reviewed dozens of definitions of mental disorder and have written one myself in dsm 4 And I find none of them the slightest bit helpful, either in determining which conditions should be considered mental disorders and which not, or in deciding who is sick and who is not. That's, that's the guy who wrote the book, says this is not the slightest bit helpful in deciding who's sick and who isn't. All right. Here is uh, Eric Maisel. He is a professor of psychology, and this is, this is from an article he wrote in Psychology Today. Again, this is, I didn't get this out of like a, a Billy Graham newsletter or anything like that. This is, uh, this is from Psychology Today. The very idea that you can radically change the definition of something without anything in the real world changing and with no new increases in knowledge or understanding is remarkable. Remarkable until you realize that the thing being defined does not exist. It is completely easy, effortless really, to change the definition of something that does not exist to suit your current purposes. In fact, there is hardly any better proof of the non-existence of a non-existing thing than that you can define it one way today, another way tomorrow, and a third way on Sunday. Well, I'll do one more. This is uh, Herb Cutchins and uh, Stuart Kirk. They're uh, uh, professors of uh, uh, psychiatry at Harvard University. Um, the category 
of mental illness itself is an invention, a creation. It may be good and useful. Uh, it may be a good and useful invention, or it may be a confusing one. DSM is a compendium of constructs. And like a large and popular mutual fund, DSM's holdings are constantly changing as the manager's estimates and beliefs about the value of those holdings change. These are, uh, these are really smart people. Harvard University, Duke University, leading the effort to write this thing. And they're going, um, the emperor has no clothes. In fact, uh, the, the uh, uh, Herb Cutchins and Stuart Kirk uh, uh, quote comes from a book called The Emperor Has No Clothes. Um, and they're saying, guys, look, here's, here's what we found out from working on this. And the way this works is not the way you, uh, you think it works. Now, I want to be really clear. I am not saying that people don't have real problems at all. Uh, I am not saying that the realities in here don't point to something real. I'm saying that uh, if the realities in here point to something real, it's very, very hard for us to know it and to trust it when so much can change by a vote and when the leaders who get involved in this uh, wind up walking away and saying, guys, this just doesn't, this just doesn't work. And so what I want to do is not say at all, listen, I know there are people in this room, I know there are people watching, I know there are going to be people listening who have been diagnosed with uh, at least a mental illness and, and many several I honestly, I would rather die than be accused of not caring about your problem. Uh, I, I would rather not have my job than have you walk out of here and thinking that I don't think your problem exists or that I don't think your problem matters. I'm not talking about the existence of problems. I'm not talking about the experience of pain. I'm talking about whether the, sec, uh, the secular way that we talk about it in 21st century America is the best way. That's that's what, that's what I want to consider. And, and that honestly gets to, uh, to tonight. And why are we talking about this in church? Um, listen, the, uh, <laughs> the reason we're talking about this in church uh, is uh, a, lot of, a lot of churches talk about this. When I first moved to, uh, when I first moved to Jacksonville, um, I, I'd been here a month or so, and I just did a Google search of some of the large and influential churches in town. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to name names. I think that's tacky and uh, unhelpful. Um, but I just want to let you know about a problem that I observed. I uh, uh, do the Google search and uh, a, a church in town that uh, I came to know was, was a popular church. It was large enough. There's I think there was about five or six churches that first month that I just went and I looked at their website and I listened to several sermons from their, from their pastor. And in two of the churches uh, that are large and influential churches in Jacksonville, within that month, uh, they had had somebody come up on the platform and say, hey, everybody, there's a time and a place to talk about the Bible, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, I want to talk about this. And they would either talk about the DSM or they'd talk about some uh, popular distillation of it. And they said, we're just going to, we're going to talk about that today. And I'm just telling you personally, as a minister of the gospel, um, I would never walk into the pulpit on Sunday and say something like, the Bible's a great book, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this other thing. Uh, and they were talking about the kinds of things that were in here. I, I was really surprised. I had never heard of, uh, of anybody doing that. The, way, the reason I'm here uh, tonight is because uh, Pastor Sean was doing the same thing, uh, and he found another one of those uh, large and significant churches in Jacksonville. He found that they had had um, a, a whole sermon series on this, and I, I didn't listen to it, but, but he did. And there wasn't uh, the discernment that what I'm saying to you is true. That, that the mental illnesses in this book, for the most part, there's some exceptions, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, but for the most part, it's not like low blood sugar. 
It's not like hypertension. It's not like a broken bone. Um, they are, they're mixing categories and talking about it in confusing ways. And I, I want to help you understand at least a little bit uh, before we're done here in the next 20 minutes um, that there is a better, more sophisticated way to do this. And if you are a Christian who loves the Bible, you are going to have an edge on the insight of, uh, of, of secular people. This is where we get to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and where we start to move uh, a little bit uh, closer into the uh, Jesus part of this and away from the mental illness part of this. Um, there are a couple of confusions in secular psychology. One confusion is understanding problems. Understanding problems. Um, and there is a significant reason having to do with biblical truth why there is confusion about understanding those problems. And this uh, passage that I read at the beginning, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 16, uh, he says we don't lose heart. So Paul starts out saying, you can be encouraged. You can be encouraged. He's, he's talking about life in a broken world. And he says, I want you to be encouraged. You don't have to lose heart. You don't have to despair. You can be encouraged. Why could you be encouraged? Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. In the Bible, the Bible teaches us that what it means to be a human being is to exist with two constituent elements. So uh, uh, this is just going to be a, a schematic here. Uh, every human being has, uh, Paul calls it an inner man and an outer man. Uh, more popular biblical language is a body and a soul. Um, what it means to be a human being, you remember in the creation account where uh, the man, uh, f uh, God forms the man out of the dust of the earth and he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. You have there at the very beginning at creation, you have human beings have a physical element and a spiritual element. The physical element is what you can see and feel. And the spiritual element, the inner man, the soul, the spirit, the will, the mind are all different, different kinds of language to refer to this one immaterial element, this one immaterial aspect of who we are. Uh, that, sometimes that soul is called your heart. And in a place like Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. That is to say that your soul, your inner man, your spirit guides and steers and directs your body. Um, you see this when someone dies. And we say, when we go to the funeral home, uh, or when we go to visit them at the hospital before they take them to see them, we say, they're in there. And then we go in there and we look, and you know, we say, there they are, but you know that's not them. Where did the laughter go? Where did the smile go? Where, where did the interesting part go? And, and just left this lump that later in, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, we're call, it's called a tent. We have this tent. Um, well, uh, what happened is the spirit left. That's what death is. Biblically speaking, death is the separation of the soul from the body. Now, here's why this is so important. Secular people are monists, is the technical language. Uh, they are materialists, is the other technical language. That is to say, they don't believe this exists. Uh, what it means to be a monist, what it means to be a uh, materialist means you're a hunk of flesh and that's it. There is no inner man. There is no inner person. There is no soul, spirit, mind. Uh, you are your body 
and that is it. Um, there is nothing scientific about the biogenic theory of mental illness. It's based purely on assumption. If you're a lost person, you need the biogenic theory, you need the theory that all of your problems are biological because biology is all you've got. Now here's the thing, biology isn't bad. Uh, I am thankful for internists and general practitioners and dentists and orthopedists and neurosurgeons. I'm thankful for all those things. Our bodies are crucial. The Bible uh, honors the body. The only way you know to honor the body, actually, uh, is because God teaches us that it's valuable, because the Bible teaches us that God made it. The people who don't believe the Bible are the ones dishonoring the body with euthanasia and abortion and transgender operations and all this stuff, these assaults on the body come from people who don't believe the Bible, who don't know that God made the body to be uh, respected and valued and cherished. But the body isn't all there is. In fact, this passage that we just read, or that we just read, teaches us that this body, the outer man, is wasting away. It is, uh, it's going down. It's, uh, we get, uh, <laughs> I, it's amazing. I, I, I always remember that the first time I really noticed this was when I was 26. 26 is not old. That is not old by any definition. But I realized when I was 26, that I was eating exactly the way I had always been eating, but my pants didn't fit anymore. I'm like, I don't, I'm doing everything the way, the way I've always been doing it, and these things don't fit anymore. Why is that? Um, it's, and, then, and then now, you know, you're standing in the mirror, and you're like, what, what is that? Um, my, uh, my daughter, she used to, this was like her thing, she used to come and count my gray hairs. But she quit because she can't keep track of them anymore. She says there's too many. Um, we laugh about these things, but the reality is all of it is signs that for every single one of us, do you know this? From the moment you're born, you also start to die. This outer person the Bible says, is wasting away. But this inner man, my goodness, is being renewed. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Our outer self is wasting away, but our inner self is being renewed day by day. That means that you, as you walk with Jesus, as you study the Bible, as you live life in this community, uh, you're getting older, and tireder, and weaker. The tent that you have in this earth is collapsing. But your soul's being renewed. You grow in joy. You grow in wisdom. You grow in hope. I, I, one of my favorite, I talk to people at First Baptist, and they say, um, the older I get, the more I think about heaven. And I think about how wonderful it'll be. I think about how wonderful it'll be to see Jesus. Uh, I think about how wonderful it'll be to be restored to fullness of health and joy in heaven. Uh, you know it because you believe the Bible, and you know that you're more than this. You know that you also have a soul that is growing in grace, that's being renewed even as the, uh, as the outer man weakens. What this means is that um, if all you've got is a body, then all you've got is despair. Right? I mean, no matter how many influenza vaccinations you get, no matter how many broken bones you get repaired, no matter how many times they move that nerve off that, uh, that blood vessel, off that pesky nerve, um, no matter how many heart pills you take or how many heart operations you have, eventually you're going to get the illness that nobody can fix, right? The, the time is coming for all of us when we get sick and we don't get better. And that is, that is very bad news uh, if all you've got 
is a body. But if you've got a soul that's being renewed, and you can look forward, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, we know that if this tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He's saying you, you change addresses, you change locations, your spirit leaves this tent, rumpled, old, smelly tent, and it goes to heaven where Jesus is, is preparing a place for us to live forever. The DSM and all secular people can't see the soul. They can't see what gives us hope. They can't see what our biggest problem is. Um, your biggest problem is not that you're getting old and dying. Your biggest problem is not that your memory doesn't work the way it used to, uh, or that your back hurts. Your biggest problem is that you've sinned against the living God. And uh, secular people can't see it. When you can't see the soul, you can't see sin. When all you see is the body, all you see is disease. And that means you will misunderstand uh, the problems people have at a level of depth. If you know um, four things um, about the way God made you to be, you'll know more than the richest, most influential, most powerful psychiatrist that had anything to do with the DSM. Four things. If you know, um, we, we, uh, we won't talk about the biogenic theory, we'll talk about biblical truth. First, we have a body. We have a body. We care about medical problems. We care about medical treatment. Uh, we, don't, we don't have some weird view that we just, uh, uh, we only trust the Lord and we don't pursue medical interventions. One of the ways we trust the Lord is by pursuing medical interventions. One of the ways we receive the grace of the Lord is when really smart, um, I always joke that the MRI company hates me, or the MRI company loves me and my insurance company hates me. I, I have had so many MRIs, I've been in that tube so many times, I don't even know how to tell you. And even though I can't see the images, I'm always, I can't believe they can do this. They can see these little blood vessels in your brain, and they know where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. You, you, you get wheeled into these operating rooms, and it is the envy of the modern world. The, all these screens and all this equipment, and you go black for a second, and then you wake up, and everything's fixed. It hurts, but it fi it's fixed. Or they, at least that's what they tell you. The body is wonderful, and treating it is a wonderful thing. But if all we're left is what I said a minute ago, if all we're left is physical interventions and we all die, then that's no good. We need something more than that, because the outer man's wasting away. We also need to know that there is a soul. You have an inner person and it is what guides and steers and motivates your body. And the problems of your soul are infinitely, infinitely now, more important than your body. Did I say the body's not important? No. I'm, I'm trying to put first things first and second things second. Uh, if you get terminal cancer, but you are in love with Jesus Christ. Will everything be okay? Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. If you love Jesus, cancer can't take a single thing away from you that Jesus can't protect you from. If you're a marathon runner with uh, blood pressure 120 over 80 and uh, a resting pulse of 40, and you hate God, is everything going to be okay? No. No, you're in trouble. You're in forever trouble. You have to fix that at all cost. Uh, it's not that the body's unimportant. It's just that the soul is the most critical thing. And if your soul is alive, if your inner man is being renewed, your body can waste away, and by the way, it will, and everything will be all right. Secular people don't know this. These people don't know this. But you can, just from a quick devotion from 2 Corinthians 4. Here's, once we talk about, so that looks like soul. Sorry about that. It'll be soul. Um, then, uh, here's, uh, well, I'll just do this one. Here's the next one, sin. Oh my goodness. If there's no soul, 
because everything that exists is material, and so there's no God, then there's no sin either. But that's not true. Um, One of um, the most glaring realities in this book is how unreliable it is. The first thing that's unreliable is um, I've been emphasizing that they don't recognize there's a soul. Everything's biological. Saying everything's biological, all of the problems in this book um, are all understood to be physical. But you're going to read problems in this book that you're going to know aren't physical. Uh, There's going to be spiritual problems. Some people are sad not because they have seasonal affective disorder. Some people are sad because they're guilty before the Lord. Their consciences are convicting them. And we would say to such a person, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Jesus says, if you're sad over your sin, the system's working. And we live in a world where people get sad and they swallow a pill. I think this is a pro- some kind of physical problem. I have to fix it. But Jesus says there's a, there is a time to mourn. There is a time to weep. And in fact, when you hear about your sin, if you don't weep and mourn, then you're in more trouble than the next guy. Uh, so some things really are a problem of the soul, and you won't find it in here. So even when you find, there's, there's legitimate physical problems in here, like, um, like autism spectrum disorder. Autism spectrum disorder is a real physical problem. Um, but what's the difference between autism spectrum disorder and the person who gets labeled as depressed because they're sad over their sin. They would never say you're depressed because you're sad over your sin. But um, So I'm, I'm mixing categories. But what's the difference? Well, you can't tell from this book. You can't tell. You have to bring a biblical worldview to it to know, hey, the physical issues in autism spectrum disorder are different than a lot of what would masquerade as clinical depression because somebody's sad over their sin. So it's just, it's just confusing. It's unreliable. You hunt and peck and you go, well, that one could be physical and it could, be not, it could not be. So, so even depression. Some depressions are physical. Uh, if you have uh, hypothyroidism, is that the one? Hypothyroidism, uh, you're going to be sad. Uh, my, my former boss at, um, uh, uh, at Southern Seminary, he had... Uh, hypothyroidism, and they put him on medicine to take care of it. And he cried. This guy is the toughest guy ever. And he would just cry when he was on this. And they said, you're going to be a little emotional when you're on this medicine, but it's going to get better. And uh, his wife came downstairs, and here's this big grown man just weeping on the couch. She said, honey, what's wrong? And he goes, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> he just was sad. And it was, a, it was a physical problem with his thyroid. So, 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 it's, so these things are complicated. But what we're looking for in physicality is pathology, uh, which is, and, and what we're looking for with soul problems is morality as determined by the Lord. That gets us to this sin issue. So if you don't see sin, then you're going to be confused because the editors of the DSM don't see sin. They can take out homosexuality with the stroke of a pen. Um, Who cares? We voted. It's not a disorder anymore. Um, I uh, met a woman in the second church that I pastored. She was a 16-year-old. Went and visited her in a juvenile detention center. Uh, She had stolen a car, robbed a liquor store, smacked her mom, and hit her dad. Sent her off to juvie. And she got diagnosed with obstinate, defiant disorder. And when you look up obstinate and defiant disorder in the DSM, you are going to read a list of descriptions that sounds just exactly like Romans 1, where the Apostle Paul said, these guys call it obstinate and defiant disorder. The Apostle Paul calls it disobedient to parents. (laughs) They don't see sin. They see a biological problem that we have to treat physically, and they miss the soul, and they miss sin. And then the other thing is, uh, the final thing is uh, suffering. Not every problem you've got is, uh, is because of something you did wrong. A lot of our problems are because bad things that happen to us. And uh, we, uh, we need to remember that in a broken world, suffering 
make sense. This light, verse 17 says, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. God is able to use our suffering to fit us for heaven, precisely to make our soul grow. Most of you on the other side of serious suffering, you've grown and you have been stretched. I just talked with a, with a couple right before I came up here, went through one of the most horrible situations you can imagine, and they love Jesus more. They love Jesus more through, the, they crying in my office, talking about what happened to them years ago. But their tears were full of hope because they love Jesus. And Jesus used the pain to make them better, uh, to fit them for heaven. Uh, this is something that we can know because we believe in the soul and because we believe in the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is, uh, is always fitting us for heaven, even, even in the light and momentary affliction. My, my introduction to mental illness was from my mom and manic depressive disorder and uh, OCD and uh, depression and uh, alcohol use disorder, as they call it. And my mom stopped drinking, and she uh, got uh, all of these other diagnoses, and she was on a cocktail of, of, of medication, and she got worse. The joke with me and my three brothers, all, all of her sons, the joke was, um, at least when she was drunk, she would pass out. I mean, that sounds terrible. I was less mature then than I am now. That sounds terrible. But I mean, she was as mean as a snake. And it, I, like we couldn't, there was never any relief. And she would take these pills. She called them her crazy pills. I'll talk about that another time. She'd take these crazy pills and they were supposed to make her feel better. They didn't. She got worse. She was completely crazy. And then one day she got on her knees and asked Jesus to forgive her of her sin. And he did. And she got in her right mind. Uh, she uh, went to her doctor and said, I don't need these pills anymore. And she weaned off those. Don't quit taking your pills. I'm not telling anybody to quit taking their pills. I'm not a medical practitioner. That's between you and your doctor. I'm not saying I'm telling you my mom's story. She did the right thing. She went to her doctor, said, I don't want to take it anymore. And he helped her get off of them. And she became a sweet, godly, wonderful mother, grandmother, mother-in-law. And every expert that she talked to thought she was ill, but she found out she was guilty and she needed to be forgiven and the Lord forgave her and she changed. I'm not saying that you don't have your problem and if you'll just ask Jesus to forgive you, everything will be all right. I'm saying that your problems are more complicated than what you can tell uh, from a secular worldview and that's what we're going to be talking about in the weeks ahead. And if Jesus is alive and if Jesus stands behind this truth then there is hope in our suffering, there's hope in our sin, our souls can be renewed, and our bodies get renewed too, so that they're perfect when Jesus comes back. Let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your gift of body and soul. Thank you for the gift of your truth. I pray for every single one of us. All of us struggle with difficulty. All of us struggle with pain. And in one sense, it doesn't matter what we call it, the pain is real. And whoever we are and wherever we are and whatever we're dealing with, I pray that you would draw near to us and by your grace and through your truth and through medical professionals and all the rest that you would help us to grow in grace and wisdom. And I pray it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.